So that's three straight weeks now where we've had um, scriptures where people didn't recognize Jesus as he appeared to them. We had um, Mary at the tomb think Jesus was the gardener. Then last week we had when Jesus came to the beach, they weren't quite sure it was him at first. And then as he told them to throw their nets on the other side of the boat, they, they recognized Jesus. More of them recognized Jesus. By the time they got to the shore, they all recognized Jesus. Then again here on the road, they don't recognize Jesus when he comes up to them. It started making me think about all the different movies that have like mistaken identity where people either think someone is someone else or don't. Who can think of some good mistaken identity movies? Julie already said one this morning in reference to another movie. Anybody think of good mistaken identity movies? There are a ton of them. Come on, people. Trading places? Yeah, kind of. Kind of. Trading places. I didn't have that one, but yeah, I could see it. Oh, like the mask removing? I didn't think of that, but that's true. They, they definitely pretend to be somebody else. That's true. And Harry Potter with like a polyjuice potion and stuff, yeah? Especially Goblet of Fire. Yeah? So Big Lebowski, Julie mentioned, mentioned this morning, that's a huge one because the whole movie starts because these thugs think that he's the other Lebowski, but he's just the dude, Yeah. Um, of course, if we, huh? Fight Club, a little bit, yeah. Um, one that I thought of uh, that's um, playing with biblical themes is Life of Brian, Monty Python. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock does this a lot, but one of the best ones is North by Northwest. Good, uh, good one. And then uh, Galaxy Quest where the aliens think that they're really the, uh, the, the captain and the crew of the ship. Um, and then one of, the, one of the classics, of course, is uh, Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator, where the, uh, you know, his, Alfred, or his uh, Adolf Hitler um, parody, where um, the, the great dictator and this, and this Jewish person are mistaken and end up switching places. Um, Dave, yeah, Dave with the president. <laughs> yeah, that's, an, that's another one. So there are really like a ton of these, a ton of these movies where the plot has to work by somebody being confused for somebody else or them not realizing who it really is. And that's kind of what's going on in this story. But I feel like maybe the better example would really be Undercover Boss, but I've never seen an episode of Undercover Boss. I, I know what the, you know what the idea is, and that's that you have the CEO or the boss of the company gets in disguise and goes and works among the smaller people. My really only experience with Undercover Boss is the Saturday Night Live bit where they did the Undercover Boss thing, but it was Kylo Ren from Star Wars. <laughs> And they have him going around the, uh, the First Order pretending to be this maintenance worker, but it's really Kylo Ren, and everyone knows it's really Kylo Ren. <laughs> that's really my only experience with Undercover Boss. But I think that's more kind of what fits what we have here. We, like I said at the beginning, have kind of a recurring theme and that the people don't recognize Jesus right away when he reappears to them after the, after the death, when he's been resurrected. And I think that makes sense because none of them expect, even though he told them that it was going to happen, none of them expect to see him again. They saw him die. So their mind comes up with some other explanation. Oh, you must be the gardener. Where's his body? There's a lot of similarities in the Jesus appearances, but there's something different that happens in this one. This one's different from the others. For one, this is the only of the Jesus reappears story 
where we don't have characters we already know, right? We know Mary, Jesus' Jesus's friend. We know Peter. We know the beloved disciple in John. We know some of those disciples that are out fishing. We don't know Cleophas, and we don't even know his friend's name. We don't know who they are at all. This is the one story we, we don't have an appearance to people that we're already familiar with from our narrative. Now, we can tell from context that these are people who've been with Jesus apparently for some time. They've been part of the movement. They've made their way towards the inner circle of the movement, but they aren't the names that we know. And maybe that's part of why this story resonates so much with us. It's easier to put ourselves in the place of these disciples we know nothing else about. We don't have the other stories about them, so they can be whoever we want them to be in our minds. We can connect with them a little bit easier. So that's what I want to do now as we kind of go through this scripture and think about what it's trying to say to us. As they're walking we see that just like in John's second ending last week, the, when the disciples don't know what to do with themselves after they find the tomb empty, they kind of return to what they know and they go fishing. These two appear to be going home. Like, I guess it's over. Let's go home. And so they walk to Emmaus. Now, we don't know that they're from Emmaus, but we know that they have some place to stay in Emmaus. We know Emmaus is their destination. So it seems like maybe that's where they're from. They don't know what to do. All they know is there's some rumor that Jesus is alive. I mean, the women have said that, but they don't have any proof of it themselves, and they don't exactly trust the women. Now, when they're talking about it to Jesus, not knowing it's Jesus, they're a lot kinder to, um, of their position than the gospel itself was. When the women come back and tell the disciples, Luke tells us that the disciples thought it was a foolish tale, like that they were telling foolish tales. They say themselves, well, they astounded us. We don't know what to think. So they're not quite honest <laughs> with what their response to the women were, but they don't really know what's going on. They definitely don't believe the women, so they hit the road back to Emmaus. They're going home. And then as they're talking to this person, as they describe their experience of the last few days, they say, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. So the text gives us the fact that they really don't understand what Jesus was about, what the whole point was. Because in their mind, Jesus can't do that dead. There's no way that Jesus can defeat Rome and bring Israel back to its former glory if he's dead. Because the only way they think that can happen is basically marching on Rome with Jesus at the head of an army, the way that these things have always been taken care of, in battle, in power, in might. And the one that was supposed to do that was tortured and hung on a cross by the people he's supposed to defeat. And then they say, moreover, it's been three days since that happened. Now, why would they say that? That's a weird thing to say. Other than we get three times in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus telling his disciples that three days later, I'm going to rise. I'm going to come back. So you know that's been stuck in their head, but it's also clear they don't believe it. They have the information they need, but it's clear that they don't believe it because they're like, you know, wait, didn't he say something about three days? I mean, it's been three days, but clearly he's dead. I mean, you know, the women said that they saw some angels that said otherwise, but I mean, he's dead. We saw him die. They can't make that move, even though Jesus had told them this is what was going to happen. Even though some of them had seen the tomb empty themselves. 
Well, no angels told us anything. Clearly, he's dead. So they're on the road moving away from everything that they'd been working towards. And they're doing it at the climactic moment on day three. When this stuff is supposed to happen, they're like, well, time to go home. I guess it's over. It's like walking out of a movie at the end of the second act. You ever notice how in movies, like, there's always that point when everything has gone wrong for the protagonist. And it looks like, man, I don't know how they're going to get out of this one. Or I don't know how these two people are going to get back together. I don't know how things are going to go right because every single thing that could go wrong has gone wrong. It's over I mean, I know that it said it was a two-hour movie and it's only an hour and 30 minutes, but clearly nothing good can come from this point, so I'm going to leave. Now, of course, we know that real life aren't like movies and the triumphant and sometimes wildly improbable that happen all the time in movies don't happen all the time in real life. So it's easier to understand why they would walk away and why they would think it's over because it's real life these things don't happen in real life so they hit the road defeated because they didn't understand but then jesus proceeds to open up the scriptures to them in other words jesus is walking them through how god has interacted with the world throughout religious history how God has provided for God's people, how God's ways are different than the ways of the world, how often those who work for God's ways have to suffer, maybe even be brought down, even killed, because the world wants to work even harder to protect the way that it's set up. And it sees God's way It sees this overturning of the world's way of power and hierarchy and might. It sees God's way as dangerous and threatening to those who are in power. Side note, they're right. It is dangerous and threatening to those who are in power because the power set up that the world has is not the way that God wants the world set up. And it's one of the main themes of the Gospel of Luke that God is working to overturn everything that the world has set up, to make right side up again what the world has turned upside down. So those in power, those lording it over others, holding on to the majority of the resources for themselves, making sure that they get theirs at the expense of anyone and everyone else, that's not the way the world's going to work if God has God's way. One commentary I wrote read that Jesus was trying to explain to them that Jesus' death was the center point of the divine human struggle over how life is to be lived, in humility or in self-glorification. Though anointed by God, though righteous before God, though innocent, Jesus is put to death. Rejected by people, He is raised up by God. And that's what Jesus is walking through. Like, look at what has happened to all these prophets who've tried to do God's work in the world. Don't you see the world isn't isn't on board with what God wants? So this Messiah that you talk about had to suffer and die because the world just can't accept what he's trying to do, what God is trying to do. And what they didn't get, what they don't get, is that God's way and the world's ways are so very different, completely opposite, in fact. So they don't get that the one supposed to redeem us can be the one who is crucified. It makes no sense if you're only looking at it through the lens of how the world works. The one to save the world gets brutally killed? 
It doesn't make sense. It doesn't in the way that the world is set up. Because the one to save the world has to be out there swinging a mighty sword, has to be out there leading the battle cry with hordes of soldiers behind him. That's the only way you can make a difference, the world says. But Jesus opens up Scripture to them, shows the difference in God's way from the world's way. That power and glorification, strength and might, hierarchy, prestige, privilege, all the things that the world values aren't how God works. And while that's working on them, while that's matriculating in their brain, they do do something very Jesus-like. Like, hey, it's late. Why are you keeping walking? Come stay with us. They open up their house to him. Invite them in. They show hospitality, which is a very God way thing. Give of what you have for others. They invite them in. And then Jesus does something that he does over and over again, especially in Luke's gospel. Joel Green, one of the commentators I read, writes, In keeping with other meal scenes in the gospel of Luke, Once he's at the table, Jesus' role shifts. He's no longer the honored guest. He's the host of the meal. And it's in this role that he distributes the bread. And then their eyes are opened. Now, it's very common, and I do this myself, to look at this in a very Eucharistic way and and to look at this as as a very communion-centered idea. He breaks the bread and gives it to them. And it's using the same words that Luke used at the Last Supper. He took the bread. He broke it. And after giving thanks for it, he gave it to them. It's the same exact words, but it's not the first time that those words are used in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, the communion, those words are echoing an earlier time in the Gospel of Luke. They're the same words used when Jesus feeds the 5,000. They're the exact same words used when Jesus takes the few loaves of bread and the few fish and multiplies it to feed everyone. Because that's what Luke wants us to remember in the communion scene and in this scene. And every time Jesus is at the table, Luke wants us to remember Jesus' action of making sure that everyone is fed. Because that harkens back to Jesus' mission statement at the very beginning of Luke. When he comes out of the wilderness and he goes home to Nazareth and he takes the scroll and he reads the scroll from Isaiah. I'm going to feed the hungry. I'm going to bring sight to the blind. I'm going to bring freedom to the captives. I'm going to make sure that all those on the margins get what they deserve. I'm going to take care of the oppressed and the poor. That's what I'm here to do. He closes the scroll and he says, this scripture has now been fulfilled in your presence. And what do they try to do? They try and kill him. Because he says, my purpose is to upend This power structure of the world where those on the margins, those on the edges, have no hope, have no one who looks out for them because everybody's too busy looking out for themselves. And then he goes out and there's hungry people and there's just a little bit of food and he makes sure that everyone gets to eat and there's baskets left over. It's the whole point of the Gospel of Luke. And They get it explained to them in Scripture and then in action, and that's when their eyes are opened. And then they look at each other and they say, you know what we got to do? We got to hit the road. Even though they just said it's too late for anybody to be walking anymore, stay with us. The day is over. But they've got their mission back. The only thing they can do now is go on the road again. 
And so they do. The ways of the world are not the ways of God. And that's how one who is condemned and put to death can redeem Israel. Because even death is powerless against God. The ways of the world have no sway on God. So they hit the road again. This time back to Jerusalem, back to the mission at hand, back to God's purpose and their part in it, even though it's late. They make their whole journey again. Because the ways of the world aren't the ways of God. There is still work to be done, bringing the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven. Their eyes were opened and their purpose is clear. It's time to get on the road again. Time to work to make sure that we turn right side up everything that the world has turned upside down. So they can't wait even a minute. It's time to get back on the road again. May we have the same response. Amen. Amen.